Leslie, in your TED Talk, I believe you said that you sat your family down initially and said to them, I need your blessing to do this film because I will not be able to look at myself in the mirror and, and feel okay about not making this movie. What was that conversation like? It was difficult because my daughter was 13 and I knew she needed her mother. And she and I have an extraordinary bond. So I was mostly addressing her. My son was 16 and a half. He could have well lived without me. In fact, I think he was rather pleased. <laughs> um, no, that's not true. He's a sensitive, beautiful boy. Um, my husband is used to having me away. Um, he's an extraordinary man with the most educated heart who understands that gender should know no boundaries and no restrictions. And it's a partnership, so he takes care of the kids when I work. And that's, you know, uh, been quite, um, quite often that has happened. But my daughter needed me. So it was very important for me to communicate to her because I knew I was going. And um, that's an admission because I was ostensibly asking her permission, but actually I was telling her I was going. Um, and, and I said, look, you are my priority. If you ask me to stay, if you tell me you need me, I will stay, but, and I didn't even let her answer the question, so it was a form of emotional blackmail, I'm ashamed to say. I said, if you don't let me go, in other words, you tell me you need me, I'll never be able to look myself in the mirror again because I feel so strongly about this, I have to act on it. And she just said, of course you have to go, and that was, that was it, a decision. Well, I'm sure she heard you speaking of the story uh, beforehand and, and all the conversations. Yes, in fact, she sat and watched um, a lot of those reports. Uh, you know, indeed, the, the very first report of the rape itself, though that wasn't what had got the fire in my belly because I knew this was the tip of an iceberg. I mean, we've all seen on a daily basis these brutal, hate-filled, very violent gang rapes and rapes and abuse of women and girls happens ubiquitously across the whole world. It was the protests, it was the response to that that motivated, in fact, compelled me to go. Because here was a country doing what I feel every citizen in every country should be doing all the time until we get true gender equality. And, you know, the time really is now to start demanding this with certainty. In fact, last weekend or the, the weekend before, there have been a spate of gang rapes of little girls in Delhi. I mean, <laughs> they're going on all the time, but there's been a spate of two very brutal ones reported. The weekend before last, a little four-year-old girl was gang raped by three adult men. She was slashed from vagina to anus. Her face was slashed. She lay in the same hospital that Jyoti Singh lay in, Safdar Jung Hospital, and she had an operation, just as Jyoti had, that lasted three hours to fit her with a colostomy bag. Four years old, and she died a few days later. Ah. And that news I heard on my Google alert on the way to a screening that we had in London to mark the day of the girl. It was on that day. And I was so hurt and so in, you know, infuriated by this. Um, I and uh, Bianca Jagger, who was there to support the film that night, we both were just so outraged. We called on the audience that night to do a call to action of all women and girls across the world on the 8th of March next year we want every woman and every girl and every enlightened man to come out on strike and let the world come to a standstill as it will, as it did in Iceland some years back, when women simply stopped. They stopped taking care of the kids. They stopped their subordinate roles with their, you know, male bosses in much more prominent positions with their entitlement. And they, the whole country and financial institutions came to a standstill. So we are calling on everyone who is enlightened, who cares about gender equality, to go out on strike next March the 8th. March the 8th, okay. International Women's Day. So going back to uh, the beginning of the film, did you already have the, the family members of these 
rapists lined up? Did you know how to contact them? Because I mean, you went into some very, looks like rural areas and... That's right. How did all that Basically, um, I started off brainstorming what I wanted the film to feel like, to look like. Um, you know, really analyzing what were my objectives in making this film. I then did a, a period of quite intensive research in terms of just finding all the footage I could of the reports, and this was a very, very well covered, um, well reported incident. Um, and I started writing a list of questions for the rapists. Wow. And worked with a psychiatrist, um, had a, a forensic criminologist help me with some of those questions. Um, and, and started reading around the whole, you know, the whole subject very um, diligently. And then, at a certain point, I managed to get hold of trial transcripts. And of course, I also had appointed a researcher who found some of the addresses through the legal system, because all of the court depositions have the name and the address so we had names and addresses, but we hadn't lined anyone up. Basically, it was a question of doorstepping in pretty much every case, other than with the prison, because that was set up in advance. And I think it's very hard for me to say, because I was never faced with this, but I think if I had been told I couldn't interview those rapists, I might just not have finished this film or maybe not even have started it. To me, that was absolutely imperative. Um, there were three things I wanted to deliver with this film. The first was that the protests should be amplified, that they would be the heartbeat and the pulse of this film, because they are ultimately what um, made me feel very optimistic that the time had come to deal comprehensively with this issue that the world has neglected and abandoned for many years. The second thing was that it was very um, disturbing to me that this young girl, whose entire life was before her, was re just referred to as this 23-year-old medical student in the press, that was it, you know, who had gone to see a movie with a friend. That's all we knew about her. And in fact, until the film came out, nothing more was known about her. So it seemed to me to be crucial to delve into and, and find out and document what we have lost in this girl's murder. Um, and the third and absolutely vital leg of, of my objectives was to understand why men do this and to, you know, if you, if you can't understand them, how are you going to change them? So I needed to know what goes on in the head of a man who, who does this to a woman, who not only gang rapes her, but eviscerates her, who pulls out her intestines. Um, and, you know, what his attitudes to women are, where they come from, yeah. who the significant female figures in his life had been, what he feels about them, what is his notion of manhood, what is a man? What's a good girl? What's a bad girl? You know, so there were 150 questions I had. Um, Leslie, what was the timeline? I, I know you said you'd had to use some of your own family savings for the film. I don't know at what point you're spending money to hire these researchers, but what's the timeline? You've sat your family down, you've basically said, I need to do this and I just need your blessing. Okay, so I made the decision to make the film on the 23rd of December, that I know for sure, of 2012. It was a week after the incident. Oh, a week after, okay. And it was the point at which I'd been watching these extraordinarily beautiful sights of protesters pouring out onto the street. Um, and then on the 23rd of December is when the protests turned violent because the police, the government, decided to crack down on them. And that was when my the fire came into my belly, pretty much, and I thought, I'm going to make a film about this. Um, 
And there is no question, I really want to labour this point, it's so important. This was the first time in my lifetime, and I'm 57 years old, it's a long life. <laughs> it's the first time in my lifetime that I have seen any country, including those who call themselves civilised and sophisticated, who have gone out with so much passion for women's rights. I mean, the world has dealt with slavery, it's dealt with totalitarianism, it's dealt with race, it's dealt with so much, but it's still not dealt with the, the question of respect and the value of women and girls. Um, so it's something that's very dear to my heart, and here was India leading the world by example on this. Uh, that is why I, I absolutely felt I had to amplify those voices with this film. So, 23rd of December I decided to do it. I think it was early January when I sat my family down. And then I started reading and researching. And around May I wrote the letter to the Director General of Prisons to ask for permission. It took two weeks for her to come back and say yes. She then said she needed to get permission from the Ministry of Home Affairs because as a foreigner I wasn't allowed in Indian jails. And she applied for that permission, asked me to slightly change my letter, which I did. Um, and the change she wanted was that I had asked her precisely for what I intended to do, which was to interview the, these rapists. She wanted me to express that slightly more generally for the Ministry of Home Affairs and to say convicted rapists. I did that. I got permission from the Ministry of Home Affairs. I got on a plane in July uh, and went to start filming. Now, the day before I left for the first leg of the shoot, because I, I did three legs of shoot from July to December, I shot. And the day before I went off, I, I went to take a, a meeting on my, literally on my way out of uh, London. I went from Copenhagen to London and then to India. And I took a meeting with Channel and BBC. And Channel were quite cynical in their response to me. They said, get one of the rapists, get one of these interviews, and yes, we're interested. So I thought, ah, okay, it's only if I get one of the, well, of course, everybody would be interested if we got one of the rapists. So uh, that didn't um, impress me much. But when I went to meet with Nick Fraser of the BBC, he was so supportive. He opened up to me as a human being and not just as a cynical broadcaster and said, this is a very important film. Your passion is palpable. Uh, I like your vision for the film and I want to support you. Now, it takes us a while to work out whether we'll commission something. I cannot tell you. It'll be a while. However, I do promise you that I'll support you as Nick Fraser, as an individual. I will come with you to IDFA, which is an important um, documentary market in Amsterdam, and I'll help you pitch it because he knew that although I was a very experienced feature film producer, I had never done a documentary. I didn't know anyone in the documentary world. And um, I was immensely touched and impressed by that. So I decided the BBC would definitely get it if they said they'd commission it. But in the meantime, it was pressing, it was urgent, so I just went and carried on shooting. I didn't get any of the BBC money until during the edit. And the pressures financially were huge. They were really huge. At one point, I literally had to go into my uh, children's um, school fees account and empty that to carry on shooting. And at this point, um, the BBC has funded 40% of the budget. And we did get, thank heaven, some support from Worldview um, uh, development monies, but very small. And the rest I have funded. And I'm still carrying that debt. And I understand to this date you've not made a penny back on the film. I've right? made some back. Oh, you have? Okay. No, I have okay, made good. some back. Uh, Women Make Movies has very sweetly given me an advance 
on you know their sales of um, educational uh, DVDs because they they recognized the fact that you know and, and I've also been funding the campaigns out of my own pocket so it's uh, it's at the point now where it's it's very critical and and I absolutely have to raise money for the campaigns in order to carry on the education campaign in in particular um, but you know I kind of feel this is what I've been put on this earth to do and so I'll do it by hook or by crook with the filming in the prison you're not alone doing this you have a camera person with you yes and a sound person and my co-producer uh, and someone asking the questions in Hindi so yeah. um, there were a team of yeah I think four of us in the room with him and of course there was a prison guard present throughout okay. um, and you know there have been some ridiculous um, <laughs> accusations that I gave the rapist a script to read, to learn. Sixteen hours I interviewed Mukesh Singh. Really? Sixteen hours over three days. And, you know, all of these smear campaigns, this desperate, hysterical, pathetic attempt of some sectors of the community in India to not look in the mirror. You know, they'll do anything. Right. Well, and I know you said too that you thought that it would only be the the rapists or men that were of a certain educational uh, group that would have this feeling. But you see from the film that one man says that many of the members of parliament have unconvicted rapes on their record, um, and and that they've never really been challenged, and it takes so long to to see the process through so this mindset yeah mm -hmm. that says that men and boys are king they are the desired gender they have the entitlement and the power and girls and women are subordinate they are destined to be domestic slaves to be married off they don't need an education and they're unwelcome the mother of Jyoti, and they are so enlightened, her parents, you know, yes. and the mother tells us at one point that when she had this little girl, she gave out sweets because she was so happy. And the, the people who came, you know, the friends and family who came to the, uh, the hospital, presumably, um, to, and, and saw her giving out sweets, said, you're celebrating as if you had a boy. Why are you giving out sweets? I mean, literally, that is what they do. They don't celebrate the birth of a girl. So if you grow up as a boy, as a man, witnessing this, what in God's name do we expect them to go on to do and express in, in actions when they have this, this attitude bred into them? They're programmed, they're hardwired to know that a girl is of lesser or no value to them. And why are we surprised that they then go and commit these atrocious and hate-filled and heinous acts? We may as well give them a rapist's manual for their 11th birthday. Leslie, I know that you've received um, a, the banning of the film in India. Um, you've received maybe notifications on Twitter, various things. Advice for another filmmaker that is making a, an emotionally, politically charged film and still wants to carry on a very, very important message and has the help of others around them, but just dealing with that in general. What is your advice? Because I'm sure there's many other filmmakers, whether it's um, you know, Blackfish, you know, an Errol Morris film, there's, there's probably so many others that have been in your shoes, but it's not something that you could just pick up a book and, and find out how to deal with it. My advice is simply this. Commit 100%. Do not shy away from telling the truth in whatever form of expression that takes. If you care about this message, just tell the truth because apathy and silence and all forms of negotiating the truth because it's not quite tasteful or it's a little bit shocking. Shock is a powerful tool. Shock is important. We don't have enough of that. We don't hear the truth enough. 
we have become so inured to concepts that um, uh, th th that really uh, deal with the most fundamental uh, violations of human rights, and we've become so used to them. FGM, we give them little acronyms, you know. They trip off the tongue so easily. FGM. FGM, let us not forget what that is. A knife is taken, the clitoris of a woman is cut out, her labia are cut off. I spoke to a Somalian girl the other day who told me that one of the practices, as amongst husbands and wives, is that if a husband will go off on a business trip, he will sew his wife up, he'll come back and cut the stitches. This is what we're talking about. And the world is what? Ignoring this? It's accepting it. We have to scream out. Um, we also have to not think, how will I be allowed to do this? We have to think, who's going to stop me from doing this? And, you know, it's, it's the most important thing always is, with filmmaking, I think, is, is committing yourself to the truth and passion and integrity of what you feel. Um, because, you know, there were moments where I wanted to give up. There was one day where I was giving up. There was no question, nothing in the world was gonna keep me there. Except I happened to phone uh, um, when I thought my, my kids were asleep and thought I would get my husband. I was in the midst of a major panic attack. Um, and I think it was really, it was not long after I'd interviewed a rapist who had raped a five-year-old girl. And that just so um, drenched me in the deepest sense of profound pity for the world that, you know, given the state that we are in, that that can happen and that this man could have told me so easily um, that he did this because she was a beggar girl and her life was of no value. And I was so, um, so depressed by all this that I think that must have led to this breakdown. Um, and I phoned home literally to tell my husband to book the flight because I didn't even have the presence of mind to do that. And my daughter had answered the phone and she immediately um, knew that I was in trouble and asked me what was wrong and I then just burst out crying. I couldn't control myself. She then started talking me down off this panic attack with breathing exercises. Oh. She was 13 and a half when she did this. And then her final statement to me after telling me to write all my problems down and then start solving the little ones first. So she gave me some very practical advice. And then she said to me, and mummy, you're not coming home because I and my generation of girls are relying on you. And that was it, so I stayed. But that day I really was gonna stop and, and so badly wanted to. But, you know, the, the thing is that there are so many, when you're dealing with a difficult subject like this, there are so many reasons to stop and not do it, and there are so many obstacles, physical, practical, emotional, psychological, that unless you have that real compulsion, you may as well not start. So once you have that fire in the belly, just go with it and go all the way. And if you go all the way, that message will get through as it's getting through here. I mean, this film has sparked more conversations about gender inequality and this issue, this pressing, urgent issue of how women and girls are treated in every country in the world to differing degrees and with differing characteristics. Um, it's sparked more of those conversations in the last five months than have been heard in the last decade. So that can only be a good thing. And I think it's because of the shock. It's because of the 100% commitment. And, you know, I mean, if I, if I die doing this, my time on earth will have been worthwhile. So when I get these tweets, you know, white bitch, you deserve to be raped, um, or threats to my life, or pornography being sent, I just tell myself, fly at 30,000 feet above this. This will change when the solution is put into effect. And I have got the solution, I have to tell you, because of the insights and the perspective of having delved so deep with such commitment into this particular inquiry. 
And I just have to tell myself that, you know, these are pathetic, backward-looking people who are very soon going to be left behind when there will be new learning and the world will change. You've been vocal about your own situation, that you experienced a rape, I believe, when you were 18, 18. or so. Do you feel like you had to use that as a, as a did, did at some point as a defense because people were coming after you because I think there were you know the quote you were shaming India, whatever the the different accusations were, or was this already part of the story? Did you have to put that no. up as a reason? The or? fact that I was raped when I was eighteen, strangely enough, didn't form part of the story. It wasn't part of my motivation or my reasoning for doing the film. It was more of, an imp of a potential impediment. I was worried about it because, I'm ashamed to tell you, I didn't report that rape and I kept it to myself for 20 years, which is the worst thing a girl or a woman can do. <laughs> um, I told about m my own uh, rape because I was urging girls and women on my website, or the film's website rather, to report because rape is the most underreported crime. And, you know, all, all of these um, arguments that India rapes less than the US, I mean, it's so, it's so utterly pathetic and, and just, you know, people deflecting from the issue and trying to look in another direction. The, the statistics are meaningless. And, and, and what are we saying? My country rapes less than your country. What is that about, really? You know, all countries rape, i.e. all, countries have um, a, a very serious problem with rape and gang rape and abuse. And um, that's what we should be looking at. But I was urging women and girls to speak out. How could I not speak out myself? So I thought I have to, you know, uh, tell everyone that I'm, I too was raped. I was worried that it would be an impediment, and that is why I practiced on four other rapists before I interviewed the rapists in this case, because I didn't know how I was going to react, whether those demons would fly up during the course of you know, the interviews, sitting facing a rapist and never having had the chance to um, address my rapist, would I physically attack one of them? I thought that was actually a possibility. I was scared of that. But that's the only way that the, that experience impinged because in a strange way, I had come to terms with what happened to me. Um, and it's not something I expect, you know, most people can do or, or do do because those, those traumas are, are, are very real. In my case, I was so grateful that I'd survived because I was convinced the guy was going to kill me after he raped me. And the fact that he didn't, the fact that I got out of there alive, was such a relief to me that in a way the rape kind of diminished into, well, at least I'm alive, you know, it, it, it wasn't as... And, and I believe I've, I've kind of um, coped with it, you know, so... Yeah, so, so it wasn't part of the story, in a sense. Okay. During the, the, what is it, two years that you were actually making the film, I believe, was it? Two and a half. Two and a half, okay. I filmed for six months, um, then went back in for a little more filming uh, in, in January of 2014. Um, but the edit is what took a very long time. I had 87 hours of material, and that's partly because I was so inexperienced, of course, as a first-time director. I was just shooting everything and anything. Um, in retrospect, of course, I would have been more judicious because half of these 87 hours were in Hindi. And I, I have a smattering of Hindi. I understand more than I can speak, but I'm certainly far from fluent. So every one of those transcripts had to be translated the Hindi ones. And then I would take the paper transcript and the rule for me in editing this film, because I had nothing to fall back on, I didn't have any experience of, you know, actually structuring a film before. As a producer, I would always be very hands-on 
um, to the great irritation of all the directors I've ever worked with. Um, but I was hands-on being reactive to their first cut. This time, I had to create that first cut. And so I had to sit down and think, okay, what is the endeavor here? What is it I actually should do in terms of structuring this? And it seemed to me that the best thing I could do was to try and reflect the journey I'd gone on in terms of the insights that I gleaned. So I start off with a very narrow focus and the film just, or, or my experience, my insight just expands and expands as I understand that it's not just the rapists who think this way, it's the entire society. Um, and so when I went through these transcripts with my yellow uh, highlight marker, I was picking out the things that seemed to me to be significant in my own personal journey through the film. Because again, one of the things that I decided absolutely definitely before I left for filming was that my voice wouldn't be in there. I wouldn't be in there. I come from feature films, so my sensibilities are all about characters interacting, the story coming, you know, from... Um, the people involved in it. So I took the absolute decision that it would only be the direct participants in the story and in the case who would tell us the story. And I resist in documentaries when there is a narrator leading us by the nose, telling us what sense to make of this, I think things are much more powerful and resonant when we decide for ourselves. But the material that's laid out in front of us um, is, uh, is, is, is very you know, powerful and, and forceful. So that it's, you know, characters are putting their own um, uh, world views. And we're hit by this and then we see it 360 degrees and we quite naturally go with what the truth is because the truth will always emerge. And the documentary is, I think, actually quite balanced. I was careful to do that. Um, and, you know, even the rapists come up with some pretty forceful arguments. And I've always allowed that. You know, I didn't want to cut those out by, by any means. Um, because they are who we want to learn from. They're who we want to really hear and understand. So when Mukesh says, that when they now, um, uh, they've changed the law and, and uh, uh, recommend um, hanging the death penalty for rape in the rarest of rare cases, well, rarest of rare just means violent, extremely violent, he says rapists will now murder the victims or the, you know, the, the girls because they don't want to be identified. So they won't take that risk. Before they could rely on the sense of shame that adheres to the rape victim, which is so unjust and shameful, you know. The shame is with the perpetrator. The shame is with the society who created that perpetrator and taught him what to think and how to view women. And so for, for there to be any question of dishonor or shame on the actual girl who has to suffer this violation of her human rights is just uh, completely untenable and disgusting. Mukesh tells us they used to, you know, be able to rely on shame for a girl not to tell. But uh, now that the death penalty is involved, they'll, they'll kill her just to make sure that she doesn't identify. Because it would also hurt her dowry if it was, if it was known that she was raped. That's right. Right. Yeah. Leslie, during those two and a half years that you're shooting the film and, and going back for reshoots. What's 2 a.m. like for you? What's 3 a.m. like for you? Are you losing sleep, kind of tossing and turning? Should I have gotten this? Is this really going to work? How, how was that for you? I literally had to be on a regime and I had to train my body to sleep three hours a night. Only three hours a night. If I slept more than three hours, I was in trouble because I wouldn't have been able to complete the task. So... Sleep has not ever been a problem to me because I have so little hours, I just crash. The problem is if I sleep more than three hours, 
Once I tried that, I was so exhausted and I thought I'm giving myself another two hours tonight. And I slept for 18 hours nonstop. I just didn't wake up through alarms and, you know. So, um, no, I, I didn't, do you know, I, I don't think I've really crashed yet. And I hope I won't, but I think there's a big chance that I will, of course. Um, because it's so deep. You know, what I've seen is so deeply, deeply disappointing. And the one clue I have as to whether, you know, I might just crash one day is this, that on one of the filming legs, I came home to Copenhagen and my family were already at a party. There was a confirmation party of my husband's best friend's son. And I had to go straight from the airport. I'd come home, I think, for a week. So, you know, I was desperate to see them. And I went straight from the airport to the party with my luggage. And I was so overjoyed to be there. And there was such a festive, lovely atmosphere. And I hugged my kids and hugged my husband. And then I sat at this table. And the Danes really know how to celebrate, you know? And it was, um, I was enjoying myself. And I had this smile on my face. And I, my husband beckons me out of the room at one point. Um, and I went out. And he held me and he just said, please tell me what I can do to help you, darling. Tell me. And I said, oh, I'm getting quite emotional. Um, and I just said, um, wh why? What do you mean? You know? And he said, you're sitting there with this smile on your face and the tears are streaming down your face. And I had no idea that I was crying. Literally no idea. So it is very deep seated. Um, I, I know that I will continue for the next three years and I will continue at this pace and I will not stop unless I drop dead um, from a heart attack. But I will keep going until I get this solution, which is a human rights global education initiative that I'm advising the UN Human Rights Office on. I've already got eight countries co-opted. I'm hugely optimistic, and it's the optimism that's the antidote, of course. The optimism is carrying me through. I know that if we educate our children's hearts as well as their heads, if we do this on a compulsory basis with all the children of an adopting country, and if we do it from the first day of entry of that child into those children into school, we will empower girls, we will change gender stereotypes, we will educate children at the crucial stage when they are still modifiable in terms of cognition and when we can still modify their attitudes and behavior that they've come to, you know, even kindergarten with from home, by teaching them empathy, which is not innate, it has to be taught and it has to be practiced, by teaching them respect, teaching them moral values, and we are designing and constructing a curriculum, a global curriculum, exercise by exercise, very concrete, very specific. This is not about, oh, we're going to teach them values in some airy-fairy way. It is going to be exercise-based. They will be taught particular songs. They will be given particular stories. They will be playing particular imaginative play games. And we have various education philosophies, Montessori and Feuerstein and the United World Colleges and IB systems. And we're going to design three curricula, one for the early years, one for the middle years, and one for the senior years. We're doing that over the next three years. And in 2018, the early years curriculum will start rolling out in the world schools of those countries that do adopt. And as I say, I've got eight already and I've only just started. Um, and at that point, I'll stop and I may make another film again one day, but I will not make another film until I have done this because I won't walk away from the insights and the perspective that I have got on this film now. I've become an activist, having been, you know, it's my first and, and possibly a swan song as a director, I don't know. But I have to see this through. I can't have these searing insights and then move on to another topic. In three years' time, who knows? Maybe then it'll all flood out of me, but I will keep it in for th at least three years till I can put this into operation.